Okay, thank you, Salil, for exaggerating. <laughs> and I'll talk about uh, uh, private learning. This is a topic that uh, occupies me for about four or so years. And uh, I'll mainly talk about uh, results from recent results from this paper with Amos Bemel and Uri Stemmer that is going to appear in ITCS. And it's about the characterization of the sample complexity for private learning. Okay, so let me start with a picture. What do I mean in general when I speak about data privacy and more particularly in private learning and then we'll get into the more formal definitions. So this is a very common scenario. We have a collection of, collection of individuals. Each has her own uh, individual data, her own sensitive data maybe. And we think about the collection of this individual data as a database. It doesn't have to physically be a database. It doesn't have to be in, in the same location. Then there's an algorithm. Uh, and the reason for this algorithm is that there are many entities who are interested in learning about uh, the information that these individuals have, maybe the government or businesses and so on. And often, the algorithmic task that uh, we're talking here about can be abstracted as a learning problem. Okay, here are some, uh, and then I'll call the algorithm a learner, and the database is going to be a collection of labeled samples. Okay, uh, here's an example. Suppose my bank is interested in predicting for new customers whether, I, whether they are going to be good or bad in credit. Uh, but this learning is based on the existing customers, on the old customers, and certainly being a customer of this bank, I'm interested in my privacy being protected, okay? And also the bank has some uh, obligation to keep my privacy. Here's another example, the hospital. A hospital is interested in predicting whether some treatment is good for diabetes, and again, would like to learn that based on the existing data on the samples that uh, the hospital already has, but privacy has to be protected. And note that not only the label of a sample has to be protected, in many cases we want to protect also the sample itself, or maybe even the mirror existent of a sample in a database. Okay. So private learning, in private learning, our goal is to come up with machine learning algorithms that protect the privacy of individuals. And these are the samples. And we have two data here. One is of privacy, and the other is of learning. Okay, and you will see that the definition of private learning actually um, has these two parts corresponding to the two data that we have. There's a lot of previous work in this uh, uh, area. Uh, both in the learning community, here I only mention a few, like the boosting uh, work of Shapiri, and also in the privacy community, and I will mention some of the results during the talk. Okay, and for this talk I want to show a characterization of the sample complexity of private learning. I will try to motivate uh, the question, and I will also briefly touch implications to sanitization and private optimizations, but you'll have to read the paper for that part. Okay, so this is my talk plan. I will start with recalling the notion of private learning, of what a private pack learner is. Okay, I will recall the basic feasibility results for 2008, and then I'll start speaking about the sample complexity of private learners. Here we'll give uh, We'll talk uh, about two notions of representation. We'll use one of them as a means for characterizing the sample complexity. And then I'll just uh, conclude and present some upper problems. I think there are quite a few interesting uh, uh, research questions here that are left open. So what is private learning? Uh, so here's the definition. Private learning is just a combination of pack learning and differential privacy. Okay, so this summarizes, summarizes about seven or eight slides that you're going to see now. If you already know what pack learning is or differential privacy is, then all this is going to be a recap. But let me uh, uh, give the definitions. 
So the first part of uh, private learner, so we have these two requirements, is uh, that it's a learner, OK? And the learning, we hear, here we refer to the pack model of uh, Valiant from 84. And assume that there is some distribution on samples from this domain D. Each sample, each sample is labeled by either 0 or 1. And this corresponds to the blue and red dots here. And our goal is to find a classifier for this distribution, a classifier that is good for this distribution. And what we are given is a sample that is drawn according to the distribution. And the sample complexity, by the way, is the number of samples that we need to look at. And we need to come up with a classifier. And the requirement is that if a fresh point is taken from the same distribution that we learned on, so this is our test. If we pick a fresh point, then it will be labeled correctly by our classifier, and this will happen with high probability. Okay? So my guess is that uh, most of the people here are, uh, know the formal definition, but let me uh, put it anyway. So here's the definition. Given a distribution over samples that are labeled by C, and when I say uh, sorry. Then we define what it means for hypothesis to be good. A hypothesis is good if the error that it incurs on the distribution is small. In this case, alpha good means that the uh, hypothesis differs from the true classification of the distribution with probability at most alpha. Okay. Now, we will, when we'll talk about uh, uh, learners will have two sets of functions. One is going to be of predicates. One is going to be, I'll call it a concept, a concept class. This is C. The other is a hypothesis class. You can see that they have the same type, OK? These are just predicates. In the case of proper learning, they are going to be identical. In the case of improper learning, H may be different from C. And we'll see that this can be useful uh, the fact that we can choose H to be different from C can be useful when we try to uh, reduce the number of samples that we use in a learner. Okay? There's also the agnostic case where we don't specify C. Almost all of what I'll say today also applies for the agnostic case, but I will not refer to it explicitly in the talk. We say that in algorithm A, pack learns C with hypothesis class H. If the following happens, A is given polynomially many samples drawn from the, dis the underlying distribution P. Note that A does not know P or C, okay? But it's given uh, samples that are uh, taken from the distribution, and they are labeled by some concept in the concept class. So A knows big capital C, but not uh, the small C, the specific concept. And A runs in polynomial time, and then outputs a hypothesis, OK? And this hypothesis is good with probability 1 minus beta. This is why this is called PAC for probably approximately correct. The probably corresponds to the beta parameter, and approximately corresponds to the alpha, alpha parameter, OK? So this is the standard definition of uh, PAC learners. For this talk, we'll give away the requirement that the learner is polynomial time, OK? And we'll allow the, constructions of, uh, the construction of learners that run in exponential time, OK? Any questions? If there are any unclear points, please stop me any time during the talk. This is the first time that I'm talking about this uh, work. So probably there are mistakes and mix-ups in the, in the uh, Presentation and feel free to stop me anytime. So, for I will use a very simple concept class as my running example throughout the talk, and this is the concept class of points. This is how a concept looks like. So, the concept class contains 2 to the d, and d is the, the size parameter here. It contains 2 to the d concepts c1 to c2 to the d. And the i-th concept is zero everywhere except for the point i. So this is the point function, returns 
CI returns 1 only on i and 0 otherwise. Okay? Why is it interesting? It's not very interesting, I have to admit, but it's a very simple uh, concept class that we'd like to understand. Okay? If we don't understand this concept class, maybe we don't understand much. Okay, so at least that. It's very easy to show how to learn points with just order of one samples. And there's nothing new here. Here's the learner. If there exists an i such that we see a sample i comma 1, okay, this means that the concept is ci, clearly, and we return ci. Otherwise, either we return a random ci, or maybe we'll add the all zero uh, concept to our concept class and return it. Uh, and both solutions would work well. Okay, and you can, it's very easy to show that just a constant number uh, of samples suffice. Well, the constant depends on the parameters, alpha and beta. Okay, the quality, the probability that, the goodness parameter alpha and the probability that we want to output a good hypothesis. One thing to note is, yes? Sorry, what is the sample? The sample? Uh, the same, th there is, when, when we test the algorithm, there's an underlying distribution, P, that chooses points X and returns X comma the label of X, okay? So this is going to be a sample. Usually when we speak about learners, we assume that the, the points come, and the, the, that the samples are labeled correctly, that they are consistent with some, um, with, with some uh, concept in the concept class. But when we speak about private learners, this need not be the case, and hence, we usually append the, alg the algorithm with something that would work in case that the sample is not consistent. Okay, so this is not the only way to fix this. Actually, this algorithm didn't need fixing because we could, we don't care about the outcome when, uh, when the sample is inconsistent. But we can, uh, just to make sure that we uh, realize that samples can be inconsistent, in this case, I added this uh, check whether the samples are consistent and otherwise uh, the algorithm would fail. So this is uh, for our definition of uh, learning, of learners, and the, the simplest, maybe the simplest possible uh, uh, concept class and how to learn it. We see that we can learn points with just order of one samples. Let me go to our definition of privacy. This is the definition of differential privacy uh, by Dwork, McSherry, myself, and Smith from 2006. And here the goal was to protect individual records in the database in a, in a computation that is done uh, as is uh, pictured here on the right. And the sense of protection that we give is the following. We play this mental game where we modify the database D to what we call a neighboring database. So this means that we only change one entry in the database. And we apply the algorithm A. And what we require is that an observer, this is our adversary, will not notice this change in the database. Okay? So changing one record does not change the output distribution too much. And the reason I say distribution is that uh, if the algorithm is not probabilistic, you can show it's immediate that it does not satisfy our definition of privacy. Okay, and here's the formal dis uh, uh, definition. A randomized algorithm is, is absolutely differentially private if for all neighboring databases, so our adversary chooses these D and D prime, okay? And for all sets of answers, so our adversary chooses uh, a predicate on the, an on the answers, and this is represented by a subset of the possible uh, answers S, capital S, the probability that A returns a value in S is about the same in both cases. And about the same here means that uh, the, this, the factor between the probabilities of returning a value in S cannot change by more than E 
sorry, the, 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 these probabilities cannot change by more than an e to the epsilon factor. And if you think about epsilon as a small number, then e to the epsilon is about 1 plus epsilon. So this means that these distributions are really very close to each other. OK? Why we like this uh, definition? OK, because we made it up. But also, <laughs> uh, it has some uh, nice properties that previous definitions of privacy lacked. One is composition. If you take two epsilon differentially private uh, algorithms and you apply them even uh, adaptively, then what you get is a uh, uh, two epsilon differentially private algorithm. If you're interested in protecting a group, like a couple instead of individuals, then there is a deterioration in the privacy parameter. For instance, for two individuals, you get two epsilon uh, uh, differential privacy, but this is a smooth, kind of a smooth deterioration. You can show that this definition in, uh, is uh, resilient, in a sense, to any auxiliary information. Whatever an adversary brings from outside the system, another database, whatever you learned about the world, uh, still the definition makes sense with respect to that uh, auxiliary information. And maybe the most surprising part is that although this is quite a strong definition of privacy, there are many results showing that we can actually do useful computations while protecting, preserving differential privacy. Okay, I think this is the most surprising part of the definition in a sense, okay, in, in retrospect. And this is a very partial list. I, I just copied it from an old presentation that I gave I think, three uh, years ago. Okay, I couldn't fit the 500 uh, papers that uh, Celine mentioned uh, on this slide. But you can see that already uh, three years ago, we, we had this uh, uh, indication that you can do a lot of interesting stuff with differential privacy. Okay, so now I combine the two things and we get the definition of private PAC or PPAC for sure. This is work with Shiva Kasivi, Svanathan, Homin Lee, uh, Sofia Oskodnikova, and Adam Smith. And we define an algorithm to be a PPAC learner for a concept class C using hypothesis class H if it satisfies the two definitions. First, it's a learner, it's a PAC learner. You don't have to read the details in orange here. Okay, it only says that this is a PAC learner. This is an average case kind of requirement because we require that uh, on samples taken from the underlying distribution, this algorithm does well. And the second requirement is this differential privacy requirement. Again, you don't have to read the part in orange, but this is a worst case, worst case kind of uh, requirement. We require that for any two databases, the algorithm, uh, the, the, an attacker cannot distinguish the two, or more than this e to the epsilon. And these databases don't have to be consistent with any hypothesis. Okay. So we get this definition. So the natural next, next question is probably what can we do uh, with this definition? Is there anything that we can learn privately? And again, when we s I say learn, uh, re recall that I waived the requirement that the learner is going to be polynomial time uh, for simplicity, although some of the results also uh, hold for polynomial time learners. So this is a basic feasibility result, and at the time we were quite surprised to get it, although the proof is very trivial, it's very simple. Uh, actually, whatever you can learn in PAC, any concept class that is finite, you can also learn privately with a polynomial number of samples. Okay. And the proof goes by a generic construction. I will just run over the construction now so you see how simple it is. And also we'll look at the sample complexity that this construction actually uh, achieves. So the entire construction is a two-line construction. We define this quality function, Q, 
of a database and a hypothesis as the number of the samples that in the data set that are correctly classified by that hypothesis. Okay, it's a very natural measure of goodness. And then, oh, for, here's an example. If this is our data set, and this is one hypothesis, and the quality here is three because only three points ag agree with uh, this line, and the, here the, the quality is four. Okay. And the second line says you just pick hypothesis that in, uh, with probability that is proportional to this exponential here, e to the epsilon times the quality. Okay. So this certainly gives a higher weight on the hypotheses that are good than it does for hypotheses that are bad. And I will just run over this. It's very easy to show that this preserves privacy. Uh, I should have mentioned this is actually, uh, we're using a result of McSherry and Talwa that is called the exponential mechanism that has tons of applications in, uh, in uh, differential privacy. Uh, Privacy follows immediately from the analysis of uh, the exponential mechanism, okay? Um, and for learning, for learning, we show that essentially what you need is number of samples that is logarithmic in the, uh, in the concept class, okay? If we assume that all the others are constant. So what I want you to take from this slide is just to remember that the generic construction gives sample complexity that uh, is uh, logarithmic in the concept class. This is for if you know the Occam Razor learner from the classical learning literature, uh, we get the same uh, sample complexity. Okay. And furthermore, you can ask about what is learnable privately, and whatever is learnable in, in, in a model that is called the statistic, statistical queries model uh, can actually be learned efficiently and privately, and also we show a level for parity. We just saw that if we don't care about efficiency, then you can actually learn privately everything. So this is uh, the picture. So now we get to this question of sample, uh, the sample complexity of private learners. And I want to go back to our example of this simple uh, uh, concept class, the points, and see what happens there. So recall that we have a proper learner for points. Proper means that it also outputs a point, okay, with only order of one samples. And if we, as the generic, if we use the generic construction, Okay, of private learners, we have to pay, it seems, order of log the, the concept class uh, samples, which in this case is uh, order of these samples. Okay, so this is a big gap. This is actually the biggest that, you can, that, that can happen. Okay, and an interesting question is what are this gap, uh, whether this gap is essential? Okay, can we reduce this gap? Okay. Try to make your own guess now and see if it fits the results in a few minutes, okay? Um, so except for the uh, intellectual interest, I think, and I think this is very interesting because it can teach us something about differential privacy. What happens when we take differential privacy and, uh, and actually we take it in conjunction with another very reasonable uh, requirement on the algorithm? What happens? When we, uh, when we do that. But also practically, uh, we want private learners to be almost as efficient as the non-private ones for, pri uh, for differential privacy to be usable in practice. Okay, so this is why we're interested in the sample complexity. So for those who of you who answered uh, the, this question, yes, the gap is essential, okay? Here is a fortification for uh, your thought, okay? This uh, is going to agree with you. Um, we prove uh, in an earlier work 
that any proper private learner of points must use omega of d o over epsilon uh, samples. Okay, so this shows that in a sense, this gap is essential. Okay, uh, let me show you the proof. It's quite easy. If we look at this database, so here, all the database contains, and I'm doing a, a slight. Uh, inaccuracy. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ignoring the difference between a, a distribution and a, and a database, just for simplicity, but this is not essential. So in this database, where all the samples are i, comma 1, okay, the algorithm, the learner has to return ci with high probability, say more than one half, okay? Because otherwise, we'll get a large classification error here. But then, if we look at this database, where all the entries are 1, 1, so the sample is 1 and the label is 1, then, because of differential privacy, and because the that database is at distance at most n, or actually in this case, exactly n, from this database, okay, it, the algorithm has here also to output ci with some small probability, with probability at least e to the minus epsilon n. So this is a direct result from the definition of uh, differential privacy. We stated the definition in the case of one change to the database, and then it was allowed that uh, the difference would be a factor of e to the epsilon. If we make n changes, the, f the difference can be a factor of e to the epsilon n. Okay. And then there are about 2 to the d uh, options for i different from 1. So we accumulate all these as bad answers to for this database. So we get that with this probability, 2 to the d times e to the minus epsilon n, uh, the, the learner must output something that is bad for this database. It's good for another sample, okay? And we want that to be small, and this requires that n is at least d over omega, okay? So uh, we get a quite a strong impossibility result for a small, uh, uh, for a small uh, sample complexity for learning this very simple concept class points. And this is a bit disappointing. But then, well, let me summarize this. So what we know is that there is a proper packed learner of, the, of points. This is the generic construction of uh, packed learners that I show, showed. And we have this lower bound. And actually, there is also a follow-up work of Chaudhry and Sue uh, showing that if you take the domain to be infinite, then you actually don't get any uh, proper learner for points. But there is this word here, points, a uh, proper. What happens if we give up proper learners? Okay, this is going to be our next uh, question. And with Amos Bemel and Shiva Kassivis Flanathan, we showed that actually if you give up proper learners for points, if the hypothesis class can be another class, something different from points, then we can actually construct uh, a, learner for a, pri a private learner for points that only uses order of one samples. Okay? So we get back to what we know from the non-private case for points. But this is a bit strange what happens here. Uh, we learn points with the concept class being uh, a class of pseudorandom functions, pseudorandom predicates. Okay, so these are functions that are almost as far as can, possible, can possibly be from points. A point returns one on a single point and zero everywhere. A pseudorandom function returns one on a constant fraction of the domain, okay, on exponentially many points. But then we can also show that this is essential in a sense. Uh, there are inputs on which 
the learner must output a hypothesis that evaluates one on exponentially many points, and because otherwise we can use these uh, learners in a reduction to, uh, from uh, proper learners for points, okay? And uh, we know that this is impossible. Okay. So having this, uh, it's interesting to ask what actually characterizes the sample complexity of private learners, okay? And this is uh, the point of the new work. What we do, we give a combinatorial construct that characterizes exactly up to a very, very small, uh, maybe uh, slackness, uh, it characterizes the sample complexity of uh, private learners. Any questions so far? I'd be happy to answer. Okay. So we present two notions of uh, representation. One, actually, we already had in the older work with Amos Bemel and Kachiva. And, and this is of what now we call the deterministic representations for a class, for a concept class C. Okay? It's quite natural. The deterministic, a deterministic representation for C is a hypothesis class H that in a sense covers C, but very effi efficiently, okay? What does it mean to cover C? For any concept in the concept class, and any distribution on samples, there exists a small H in the, in, in, there exists an hypothesis in the class with small error, okay? So, why is that good? Because if we find a small such uh, class, then we can use it in the generic learner, uh, generic private learner, uh, and reduce the sample complexity from logarithmic in C, the, the concept class, to logarithmic in this representation. So this can actually buy us a lot of mileage. So this is why we call the size of the representation uh, we, we define it to be the, logarithm, the logarithm of uh, the number of uh, hypotheses in H. And indeed, it yields a learner for uh, points. But uh, this is not the best possible yet. The sample complexity is logarithmic in D. So we did uh, quite a lot. We went down from being uh, at least linear in D to being uh, logarithmic in D, but maybe we can do better. It turns out, oh, I'm missing something here. Maybe it will come up later. But it turns out that using this technique, we cannot improve. Okay, there is a lower bound on the size of the deterministic representation for points, which is exactly log D. Okay. So here's a new idea. Let's replace the deterministic representation with a probabilistic one, okay? And the intuition is that we don't really care to have a representation that is good for all concepts and prob probability distributions. What we need is a representation that is good for the concept and probability distribution that we have at hand, although we don't know them, okay? So this allows choosing the, uh, the representation probabilistically, okay? The game now is somebody fixes the distribution on samples and the concept. Then we choose the representation using a probability. And hopefully this is small, a smaller representation and hence we can gain, okay? So this is the formal definition. The Probabilistic representation for a class C is not just a hypothesis class, it's a list of hypothesis classes, okay? And a distribution over this list. So each time we pick one of one uh, hypothesis class from this list, such that 
for every concept and distribution over samples with probability, say, three quarters, if we choose randomly from one of these uh, concept, uh, one of these hypothesis classes, then it will contain a hypothesis that is good for this specific con uh, concept and uh, probability distribution. Okay, and this is where we get the magic, because we don't now we don't have to be good for every concept and and uh, probability distribution anymore. Only for those that were picked by our adversary. Okay, and we define the size of the represent of the probabilistic representation to be the max over the log of the size of these uh, uh, hypothesis classes. Okay, for the same reason as we do uh, in the first case. Okay. So let me show you how to use both uh, uh, representations. So this is the easier one. Uh, actually, both are easy. Um, how to go from a det deterministic representation to a private learner. I copied the definition of a deterministic representation uh, for you, so you don't have to uh, remember it. And now we show how to construct a private pack algorithm for the concept class C. Again, we define this quality function that we saw, and we use the exponential mechanism again. We output hypothesis, but instead of choosing the hypothesis in the class C, we choose, it, we choose it from the class H, which potentially is smaller. It, doesn't, it never has to be larger than C, of course. Okay? And this is the number of samples that suffice. Okay? So for points, what we get, okay, let's start with the second bullet uh, on, on the bottom, that there exists a deterministic representation of points of logarithmic size, okay? And hence, uh, we get uh, this algorithm with only log D uh, samples. But this is the limit of uh, this technique. Every deterministic representation for points is of size at least log D. Okay. What happens when we look at a probabilistic representation and we try to construct a private learner? Again, I copy the definition of the representation for you. And here is the algorithm that we construct. We first pick one of the hypothesis classes in the representation using the uh, distribution pH. Okay. So we picked J. Again, we have this definition of the quality function. We use the exponential mechanism, but now instead, now we pick a hypothesis from Hj, and hence the number of samples that we need is log of Hj over epsilon. And this is why we have this as the size parameter. From the fact we use the exponential mechanism, and when you analyze the exponential mechanism, you 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 get that if you, if you don't have enough samples, then the mechanism just returns garbage as answer. Okay, and the minimal number of samples that suffice is this number. Okay, logarithmic in in, in the set from which you choose the answer. Okay. So this is one direction. We can take a probabilistic representation and turn it into a private learner. Okay? But for this to be a characterization, we also need to be able to do uh, the reverse. And indeed, it's very simple. Uh, we can go from a private learner to a probabilistic representation. Actually, this was the, the, the starting observation for this entire work. And what we use is this funny property of differentially private uh, algorithms that, in a sense, I think, make the fact that we can do something with the definition even, um, very surprising. Okay? 
I can take a differentially private uh, algorithm, and usually what I'll do, I'll give it some input and I'll watch the output. But what happens if I don't give the algorithm any input? Okay, so I just pick an arbitrary input and fit it into the differentially private algorithm. I want to claim that nothing bad happened in a sense. Okay, you can run a differentially private mechanism uh, algorithm on an arbitrary input, and there is a good chance that you will get an answer that is good for your actual input. Okay, and this is what we get from differential privacy. If we run A on zero, this is the arbitrary input, it will output the hypothesis that is good for the original data set with probability, say, three quarters time e to the minus epsilon, the difference between the data sets. And the difference is at most the size of the data set. Okay? So if n is small, like if it's logarithmic in some size parameter in D, then actually we're going to see a good answer for D when we run the, the algorithm on zeros, okay? So if we run the algorithm on the arbitrary input for enough times, how many times? E to the epsilon n times, or order of that, we get a list of, of hypotheses, and one of them with high probability, so with probability at least three quarters, is going to be good for D, for the original D. And this is the way to, to construct this list of hypotheses, okay? So we run this experiment once. We get a hypothesis class, the first one. We run it the second time and, and so on. For enough times, we'll get a probabilistic representation for whatever um, a, a concept class A is good for. Okay, so that's, that's the magic. So what we get is a tight characterization. Uh, it's not as simple as I showed, and there are the, the, the parameters, uh, the epsilon and, uh, and, beta and alpha and beta actually matter and, and figure in into the calculations, but I didn't want to get the presentation cluttered with that. We get a tight characterization. Currently, the difference between the two claims is a factor of, I think, log one over alpha times log 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 one over alpha. So it's quite tight. Um, and we get that these two things are equivalent, except the, the probabilistic representation and private uh, uh, pack algorithms, except that it seems easier to work with the probabilistic representation as it's, we don't have to think about privacy there, okay? It's just a combinatorial construct, okay? And to show lower bounds on uh, and upper bounds also on, on, on private learning, it's enough to just look at the size of the probabilistic representation. Okay. So we defined a, a, a dimension, and we call it the representation dimension of a concept class C, which is the size of the minimal probabilistic represent representation for C. Uh, so these claims actually make the theorem uh, below that theta of uh, this uh, dimension samples are necessarily necessary and sufficient for privately learning the concept class C. Okay. And this is in a sense similar to the very well known VC dimension in the context of uh, classical uh, non-private learners. Also, so let's get back to our uh, simple concept class, the points, and see what we get when we talk about, when we look at this uh, probabilistic representation. We saw that the deterministic representation may not be strong enough for us. Okay. So here's a quite a big <laughs> uh, representation for points. I take all, I take subsets of all functions from 0 to 1 to the D uh, to 0, 1. Okay, I take subsets of predicates. But these are small subsets. H is 16 land 4, okay, a constant number 
of hypotheses in each of the subsets, but there are many of them, okay? But when we talk about the size of representation, we don't care how many different uh, uh, hypothesis classes we have there. We only care about the width of the fattest one, okay? And here they all have the same size, 16 and 4, so the size is order of 1, okay? Log of that. Now I have to show you how to choose, I have to show you a probability distribution of, over these sets, okay, over these hypothesis classes. And I'll just show how to pick a hypothesis class from the distribution, okay. For i going from 1 to this number, 16 and 4, construct hi by setting hi of x to be 1 with probability 1 eighth for every point in the domain, okay, every point x, and zero otherwise. So this is a quite a crazy function. It has uh, 2 to the d over 8 ones, okay? It evaluates to 1 on about this number of places, okay? And we pick all these 16 lambda 4 uh, 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 functions that we create, and this is going to be the hypothesis class H. Okay, this is how to pick it. And why does this work? So let, let's fix a point uh, concept and some distribution on the domain. And I want to show that with high probability, say three quarters, okay, there is a good, uh, there is a good hypothesis in H, okay, say that its error is less than one quarter, okay. And I will have enough room for the proof here. Uh, so first thing to note is that if we know that the J uh, that on J HI evaluates to one, then the error of HI is expected to be less than uh, one eighth. Okay, because what we get is that in, on all of the zeros, one eighth of the zeros is is flipped. Actually, it tends to be one. Using Markov inequality, this shows that the probability that we pick HI that is bad when we know that it evaluates to 1 on J is at most 1 half. And then we, uh, sh then the, the probability that the error is less than 1 quarter is at least the probability that we actually have h uh, on j and give 1 times the probability that when that happens uh, h is good and this gives this constant 1 over 16 and then because we took into, uh, this into the um, hypothesis class enough, uh, enough uh, hypothesis, the 16 land 4, we get that the probability that H fails to have a good one is at most one quarter, okay? So it's a very simple construction. Uh, the representation of, of a, a hypothesis here is not that nice, it's exponential in size, by, but it's easy to see that uh, it's enough that the entries of HI are pairwise independent, and this gives us uh, an efficient uh, way to, to hold, uh, to represent HI. Okay? So let me summarize what we know about uh, this uh, concept class. Sorry. Non privately, we can do it with order of one samples. Privately, uh, whoever thought that the gap is essential and omega of this sample uh, complexity is needed was right, but only for the proper case. Whoever thought that we can go below that, actually we can uh, to order of one samples, but this requires the learner to be uh, improper. Okay. Now that we have these two representations, yes. I just picked it to be 16 and 4, the, the width of every, the number of hypotheses in every hypothesis class here. And the size is logarith logarithmic in the 
maximal number of hypotheses in a, in, in a hypothesis uh, class. Okay, so it's just log of 16 lambda 4. Is it fine or something still confusing? No. Uh, yeah. so it's, not the, it's not that the number of 0.1 is a constant. Yeah. He picks a constant number of random functions. Exactly. Um, and with high probability, you'll have something that's a good representation of any function. Okay, maybe this notation is confusing. It's a subset of all the functions from 0, 1 to the d to 0, 1. Okay? So what's the relationship between the two uh, representations? So naively, we can take a probabilistic representation and make a det deterministic one. Okay, just take the union of all the hypothesis classes we have there, but the size grows, okay, maybe by ln r, and it can be quite bad. What we show is that the size need not grow that much. Uh, for any counter class C, the difference between the probabilistic and, rep and uh, sorry, deterministic representations is at most log D. Okay? So this, uh, we give a non-constructive proof here that is based on the, on the probabilistic method. And also, the idea that the probabilistic representation uh, can be extracted from, an, uh, from a differentially private algorithm is not limited only to learning. We can also look at other tasks that uh, are performed in a differentially private uh, way. In the paper, we'll look at uh, uh, the task of sanitization on, and what else? Uh, pri uh, private approximation. It gives not exactly a characterization, it's not as clean as with a learning case, but maybe this can serve as a tool for learning these concepts also. Okay, so now let me summarize. I uh, presented the definition of private learning and also the basic construction. Okay, uh, I presented the deterministic and probabilistic representations and how to construct private learners from these representations, okay? And I showed that we can characterize the sample complexity of private learners in terms of the representation dimension. And I think w something that is very interesting is that even though we looked at a very simple concept class, the picture is quite rich here, okay? And I think the picture can also get even richer. <coughs> Uh, you kn the fact that I only spoke about points is only be not only because I think this is an interesting concept class and it's, it's simple and, and so on, but also because we don't know how to analyze the representation dimension of any other concept class, okay? So this is a big open problem. Can we develop tools for bounding the, from below the representation dimension of uh, other concept class classes? Uh, one interesting case is the case of half lines. So these are step functions, okay? And the difference from points, and they also have a this dimension one, okay? Quite simple functions. The difference from points is that in points, the order between the points in the domain has no significance, whereas here there is some topology over the domain, okay? Um, we know very simple things about this, uh, but we lack most of the understanding here. Uh, uh, just an interesting point is that, like in points, we can show that if a good proper uh, improper learner for half lines exists, if in, in, uh, which preserves privacy, that it has to have an exponential many switches, the, the hypothesis that it outputs has, have, have to have exponentially many switches between zero and one. Very unlike the original concept class that we begin with, okay? 
a separation of the representation dimension from the VC dimension, this is an also a question. Is there a concept that separates them, or is the VC dimension actually the correct, the correct uh, measure for uh, the sample complexity of private learners? And throughout the talk, I, I told you about what we call the pure case of differential privacy. Okay? Uh, there is also a variant which is called epsilon delta differential privacy. And the results that I showed do not hold in the case of epsilon delta pr privacy unless delta is very small. Uh, and actually, first uh, results show that the picture it gets even richer when we allow delta to be uh, not very small, something like one over polynomial. Okay, so one can save in the in the sample complexity for proper learners, and it's interesting to get the characterization of what happens in this impure case of privacy. I think that's all. Yep. Thank you. So let's start with, yeah, okay, so let's start with the protection first. So this is an example. This example shows that uh, you need protect not only, say, the label of, of a sample, okay, but also the sample itself. Because in this case, uh, the fact that somebody was treated, uh, say, in the hospital, that, that somebody is in the database of people who suffered from cancer 
uh, tells about him. Okay. Uh, so our definition of privacy actually fits here. You want to uh, to give differential privacy with respect to the to a person's entire record. Okay. Now the learning task. Oh yeah, yeah. But but this is the, the algorithm is trusted. We assume that if you don't trust the algorithm, then we can use crypto for the algorithm. Okay, secure function evaluation or whatever. The algorithm is trusted. So uh, yeah, maybe I'm sorry if I didn't say it. Say we securely compute the algorithm. Okay. Okay. So this uh, there is a trust assumption. We trust the algorithm. The only thing we care about is what the algorithm outputs. The, uh, the, our attacker or other sorry, can watch the outcome of the algorithm but doesn't see what happens within the algorithm. The hypothesis can't have a, a line in it saying, like, if this is a record of Kobe, then it'll classify him yeah. this way. Yeah. So the secret is the initials and Kobe and all that. Yep. Okay. <coughs> now, the, 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 the learning task that you are describing, I think, falls well within the realm of agnostic learning. So I don't know actually how, I don't know, I can't tell exactly how the, uh, what is the concept class from which the classifier comes, okay? Uh, but I do try to learn it with some hypothesis class, okay? Uh, so uh, you can, and we did actually formulate the, the entire uh, question of constructing uh, private learners in this setting. The generic uh, construction uh, works uh, well also in this setting, and some of the other results also follow for the agnostic setting. Oh no, what I assume, so the inter interpretation is that the database is constructed from samples that were taken from the underlying probability, from an underlying probability. So I'm not sure I understood your question, but tell me if this answers it. Well, I guess uh. you think of the entire population, do we have the entire population, current population, we think of them as examples of a typical person. If Okay, thank you.